Imagine if there were infinite Ted Cruises, like there are infinite Kangs. Yeah, I said it. Ted Cruz is more dangerous than Kang the Conqueror. You heard it here first. The hunt for pop culture Easter eggs has never been more intense. Whether it's YouTube channels treating MCU releases like the Zapruder film, or Reddit posts declaring once and for all that every Pixar film takes place in the same universe, Easter eggs sustain a veritable cottage industry of blogs, podcasts, and YouTube channels. But why is this pop culture detective work so incredibly captivating? Is obsessing over perceived connections just benign fun, or is there something deeper at the heart of our fixation? And can the perennial hunt for ever more Easter eggs tell us anything larger about our cultural and even political moment? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, are Easter eggs ruining the world? Creators hiding messages in their work is hardly new. During the censorship-happy Middle Ages, heretical writers fearing punishment from the church buried notes and phrases in their text to conceal their true artistic intentions. One even used an acrostic puzzle to ink their signature on an especially erotic text. See what you did there, boy, I like it. By the Renaissance, painters like Peter Bruegel the Elder and Michelangelo embedded analog Easter eggs. Bruegel imbued his work with hidden scatological humor, while Michelangelo did things like paint one of his enemies as a resident of hell in his iconic Last Judgment. Now I'm just thinking about all the people that I would like to paint as a resident of hell. If you're thinking that too, name names in the comments, you know, just go for it. Flash forward to the Beatles and the Easter egg bonanza was full on when they used a technique called backmasking to record their song Revolution 9 in reverse. Fueling conspiracies that young Paul had kicked the bucket. But don't worry, he's still alive, according to some. But the term dates back to 1980 when Warren Robinette pissed off game designer at Atari, sick of the industry standard practice of denying designers credit or royalties for their work, built a secret room in the game Adventure where he hid his signature. Rather than scolding him for his deviance, Steve Wright, Atari's director of software development, was delighted, comparing the hidden gem to the thrill of discovering a well-concealed Easter egg in your backyard. From there, we were off to the races, and Easter eggs started cropping up in software, video games, movies, and more. Marvel soon learned that the voracious appetite for Easter eggs could almost single-handedly fuel massive box office success, and the hunt for the best of them became its own niche of internet content. So imbuing hidden meanings in artwork is nothing new. But it's still worth asking, what makes Easter eggs in pop culture so incredibly compelling? That can probably be best answered by a term you've likely never heard before, unless you're a secret acolyte of German neurologist Klaus Conrad. Now, Conrad coined the term apophenia in 1958 to describe the uniquely human urge to spot patterns in the world around us and infuse those patterns with meaning. As information science scholar M.R. Sauter explains, humans are storytellers, pattern spotters, metaphor makers. When these instincts run away with us, when we impose patterns or relationships on otherwise unrelated things, we call it apophenia. Whether we're spotting the recurrence of Starbucks coffee cups in Fight Club or illustrations of the horrors to come in Squid Game, our brains are just constantly in search of patterns in our quest for meaning making. In fact, apophenia is so damn prevalent that game designers have to actively try to combat these instincts in their work. As designer Reed Berkowitz explains, apophenia is the plague of designers and players, sometimes leading participants to wander further and further away from the plot and causing designers to scramble to get them back or better yet, incorporate their ideas. He describes how a random series of marks in an escape room he designed accidentally formed the shape of an arrow leading many participants astray, much to his chagrin. This speaks to the way that obsessing over Easter eggs can, rather than further engage us with the media we're consuming, take us out of it, and even lead us to misunderstand the creator's intentions. Now, missing out on the fun of good storytelling because you're too busy searching for clues is a bummer. But there's a point where apophenia stops being as banal as thinking that maybe some of the characters in Phase 4 of the MCU were actually scrolls. It's when our hunt for patterns where none exists veers into conspiracy theory. And this link is borne out by data. One study found that people who identified patterns in Jackson Pollock paintings, where there were none because he was just like drunkenly splattering paint on a canvas, were more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. 
And this makes sense because conspiracy theories, which provide neat solutions to confoundingly complex subjects based on small, isolated data points are, in a way, the serious cousin of Easter eggs. Both attempt to build colossal interpretations of phenomena in media or the real world based on small nuggets of often random information. This is especially relevant in the internet age, where information overload is the new normal, and pattern hunting is not merely a fun activity, but a means of surviving the onslaught of data we encounter on a daily basis. As OG leaker Edward Snowden explains, the easier it becomes to produce information, the harder that information becomes to consume, and the harder we have to work to separate the spurious from the significant. Our pattern recognition capabilities are a key determinant in defining intelligence. But we now live in a dystopian digital landscape purpose built to undermine these capabilities, training us to mistake planned patterns for convenient and even meaningful coincidences. It's like trying to catch a glimpse of something certain when you live inside a funhouse full of mirrors. In other words, damn near impossible. In other, other words, I hate funhouses full of mirrors and carnivals. They shouldn't exist. I'm sorry, but it's true. According to some theorists, the very structure of the internet makes it an easy conduit for conspiracy theory. A scholar Kathleen Stewart notes, the internet was made for conspiracy theory. It is a conspiracy theory. One thing leads to another, always another link leading you deeper into no thing and no place, floating through self-dividing and transmogrifying sites until you are awash in the sheer evidence that the internet exists. If conspiracy theories and Easter eggs are both the result of linking seemingly disparate information into one coherent storyline, it's no wonder that both have proliferated in recent decades, as the internet and its tail-eating snake of endless links became our primary means for accessing information. So we know why Easter eggs are so appealing to our meaning-seeking and pattern-recognizing brains, and we see how apophenia can quickly go from a means of reconciling complicated information into seeing Jesus on a piece of toast. I had made a grilled Jesus. Except that the toast is our entire society. And Jesus is a theory about how tap water turns frogs gay. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. Do you understand that? Turn the friggin' frogs gay. Serious crap. But what happens when apophenia enters politics? You get, and you can all say it with me, QAnon the almost entirely internet-based conspiracy movement that propagates ideas like, uh, like Hillary Clinton drinks baby blood post-workout and Trump is the messiah. Shout out in the comments if you've ever drunk adrenochrome that you bought from a Democrat. Let us know. Berkowitz articulates this connection when he compares QAnon to an ARG or LARP, with its members searching for patterns in Q's post, much the way we search for hints of young Avengers in Marvel movies. In both cases, such analysis can imbue meaning into text where there really is none, and in the process miss the actual narrative right in front of us. As Berkowitz writes, here, apophenia is the point of everything. There are no scripted plots. There are no puzzles to solve created by game designers. There are no solutions. QAnon grows on the wild misinterpretation of random data, presented in a suggestive fashion and a milieu designed to help the users come to the intended misunderstanding. It's easy for people to forget that they are not discovering the story but creating it from random data. The desire to make sense of Q's posts leads many to see patterns where none exist, much like someone misinterpreting an arrow in an escape room. And as is the case with an excited YouTuber who just found the 187th Easter egg in the preview for Loki Season 2, the payoff of analyzing the shit out of a QAnon post is the feeling of being in the know, of having solved a puzzle that didn't really exist in the first place. Whoever the Q is, they want everybody to come together. They want you to do your own individual research. It's a feeling like you're one of the few who sees things for what they really are. Unlike all the amateurs around you who can only see what's on the surface. The amateur detective is thus rewarded with dopamine and clout for their attention to detail. Of course, none of this changed after a documentary series came out, which showed that Q was 100% just some weird dude and his dad starting shit for funsies and going to like weird massage parlors in in the Philippines, I think. That was a weird show, man. Those, those, are, those are weird guys. Those were weird guys. But why are Easter eggs and conspiracy theories equally appealing? And how did a conspiracy theory based on collective apophenia come to occupy a terrifyingly serious place in American politics? Arguably, the cultural and political pull of apophenia speaks to something elementally human our desire to find order and meaning in the universe. 
The ability to do so has been on the wane over recent centuries, as the Enlightenment era helped logic, reason, and science replace spirituality as our main structures for understanding the world. As scholar David Cody writes, with the rise of materialist science and capitalist economies peaking in the 18th and 19th centuries, the notion of an ordered universe was still held to, but the role of the supernatural was either greatly diminished or eliminated. In the absence of a higher power, meaning stops being a given and starts being something that we have to search out. While human beings used to be able to excuse the randomness of things like death and illness as simply being part of God's plan, God's plan, those of us who don't believe in religion often seek out our own justifications for the seemingly inexplicable. And when the inexplicable is really inexplicable, like say a young beloved president being shot and killed by a lone gunman in broad daylight, the justifications have to be equally out there. That often means a healthy dose of conspiracy to ensure that all the crazy true elements neatly add up. In this way, as Cody notes, conspiracy theorists are some of the last believers in an ordered universe. And I mean, like, who among us didn't think it was kind of sus that they conveniently lost the footage of Epstein hanging himself in jail? You just lose that tape, that's the one you lose? Come on. We've wandered pretty far from decoding WandaVision, which in fairness is maybe the MCU's best use of Easter eggs to date because they sort of serve the story. But the connection starts to feel obvious. People search for Easter eggs and Marvel trailers because they want to understand the broader meaning of the MCU, even before they have all the critical information they need from the next installment. In the same way, conspiracy theories take hold when people try to understand the world at large, despite not necessarily having access to all the relevant information. Pizzagate is so disprovable. Okay, in the basement of Comet Ping Pong, they're saying there's a rape dungeon. Well, Comet Ping Pong doesn't have a basement, right? Okay, so, oh well. In both cases, a spider web of complicated explanations seems to reveal orderly reason and deep meaning at play. In terms of the MCU, we'd argue that the pressure to add Easter eggs and hints of what's to come often happens at the expense of the stories they're actually trying to tell. When the MCU puts Easter eggs over compelling narratives, the stakes are pretty low. But when politicians play into conspiracy for attention, power, or influence, they're doing something much more dangerous. Yeah, I said it, Ted Cruz is more dangerous than Kang the Conqueror. You heard it here first. Imagine if there were infinite Ted Cruises, like there are infinite Kangs, and there was a council of Ted Cruises that met up, and they were in charge of the multiverse. That would suck. Is when Americans tried it, they discovered they did not like green eggs and ham, and they did not like Obamacare either. And yet, in both cases, the truth is often way more rational, if a bit boring. In terms of Marvel and other content behemoths, the Easter eggs are there to keep our attention while doing a bit of subliminal marketing for upcoming projects. If I see Alligator Loki, I'm now looking for hints at a coming pet adventure series. And when it's released, I will be ready to consume. <laughs> It's not that I'm an incredibly attentive super fan, it's that they're an incredibly skilled marketing machine fueled by Disney money and answering to a group of shareholders with high expectations. And it's similarly boring, if a more high stakes, with political conspiracy. While a world full of crooked Democrats working in a secret cabal fueled by the spinal fluid of babies to ensure satanic domination of the world makes us feel like we're living in a Mel Gibson movie from the 90s, in reality, things are way more straightforward. Democrats are an, an elite group of politicians and business people, but they're less motivated by the desire for satanic domination than the desire for money and power. And much like how Marvel and adjacent entertainment companies distract us with shiny objects and deep cut Easter eggs, all to keep us consuming their content at an increasingly psychotic pace, many politicians play into conspiracy theories so we feel like they're one of us or co-opt progressive language so we feel like they get it. When in reality, they're just trying to keep us voting for them while making sure their donors and friends in the business world stay happy. Oddly enough, one thing that both these tendencies have in common is that no matter what, Disney wins. But what do you all think? Are Easter eggs way less fun when you open them up and find out what's really inside? Is political culture turning into a dark version of popular culture? Or are we all just so bored we'd rather distract ourselves with various conspiracies? Let us know what you think in the comments. Also let us know 
if you think you noticed any Easter eggs in this video, which may or may not be there. Uh, but thank you so much to our patrons. Thanks for your support. If you are also interested in, I don't know, getting our videos early with no ads, getting extra video and audio content, joining our Discord server, click the link in the description and consider supporting us on Patreon. But if you want to support us another way, keep doing what you're doing. Watch our videos, like, subscribe, comment, share, all those sorts of things. It means a hell of a lot to us and we really appreciate it. And there's no conspiracy to that. So in the meantime, I don't know, don't read Q post and we'll see you next time.